Hi, Eric. Thanks for joining me again. Hey, hey. So you've done several episodes of your podcast since we last spoke and uh, mm -hmm. really enjoyed those, listening to those. And I've also come to some clarity recently that I'd really like to have some guests on multiple times if conversations can kind of go deeper into deeper layers or new material comes up. So uh, I've had Vince Horn on twice, although it was a very specific thing that we were doing together when I had him on, but you're sort of the first guest to do twice. So very excited to be having this conversation with you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we talked a fair bit last time about your history with dance and West Coast swing. And I asked some of the questions that came up for me at the time, but I kind of wanted to dive deeper into that. And just to give a little bit of context, in the last months, it's become really clear to me, surprisingly so, that dance is a really big part of my own practice right now and my own ways of serving the world. I didn't really see that coming, but it seems to be the case. And um, I, I didn't see it coming for me either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, but particularly around combining contemplative practices with dance and motion in a way that's visible and inspiring to people and especially loving kindness practice, but also I do other practices that I've been exposed to while I dance as well. And uh, from that perspective, I have sort of like two different ways of holding dance. One is it's just fun. It's valuable for me. It's a good practice. The stakes are low. I'm just enjoying myself. It doesn't matter so much. It's just fun for me. And then on the other, because I do want it to inspire people and I want to share that, you know, these practices are accessible to everyone and they can be enjoyable and beautiful and interesting and engaging. Um, I feel some desire to cultivate my skill at dance and get better at it and, you know, make it beautiful and, and have even more skill with it. So from that perspective, it seemed really interesting to ask you some more questions about some of the things you mentioned and kind of dive deeper into your own dance practice. Um, does that all Let's make do sense? It. Yep. Great. Great. It so, makes maybe more sense than you might expect to me. Oh, say more. Uh, well, I will, I will say more, uh, eventually there's, there's a particular part that I think of what I have to say that I think will be interesting to you, but I want to like, you know, set up a bunch of context for it first. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. Um, well, the first question I want to ask is about something you said last time where you said that, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of came up with this spreadsheet of different movement practices that you were considering exploring and dance ended up being the one that you went for. And you said that you wanted to apply a bunch of the theory that you knew about learning to the skill acquisition of dance. And, you know, before we talk about dance specifically, I'd just be curious about what kinds of things you had been exposed to at that time, what the different theories and principles and techniques you knew about that you wanted to apply to dance that you were trying to bring into it. Right. So the, the main thing that became relevant for this was uh, an old CIFAR unit called turbocharging training. Um, and there were, there were a number of bits that come from this, but one of the main ones was just, what are you actually learning? Um, this is the phrase that was repeated over and over throughout the class, um, to get the uh, participants to focus on where their attention was, what was actually being practiced, uh, at any point, whenever they were, uh, practicing something, whenever they were trying to learn something. Um, he, uh, and so Michael Smith, a person who, uh, ran this unit at CIFAR, the Center for Applied Rationality, uh, taught Aikido and math and took some of his uh, teaching experience uh, into those places. And so one of the examples that he had was about um, when he was teaching a particular move in Aikido, he would see people, uh, it was a move that involved some kind of like you had to drop your hand in a certain way. And I'm not going to be able to do it justice here because I don't remember entire thing and the unit is defunct at this point, but it was very useful for me at the time. Um, there was some, some example where when the students were told to drop their, their hand, they would always go f farther and like down, they were going 
down like this. And what he had to do is he had to like hold their hand and then go, this is down, not, not this. Um, and so he, this is like one way of paying attention to just like what is actually happening when this like person is practicing this thing. And you can do this yourself, you know, and um, the way, the way I did this, and we'll get this into a bit more is like actually having videos of myself dancing and seeing what I was doing. Um, he also taught a class or Michael also taught a class on, uh, pedagogical content knowledge and this, this is sometimes more relevant for teaching others, uh, which is another thing that I've been doing with dance. Um, but it, it's, um, it's sort of an attitude towards learning around seeing it's, it's again, sort of seeing what's actually, what's actually happening. What's, um, what what is being uh paid attention to and by who uh i think yeah that one is a bit more relevant for teaching actually now that i think about it but those are those are two of the big ones that came up um hmm I'm noticing that i didn't actually think too much about the ones outside of dance or movement practices as much uh, and may maybe we will be able to come back to them I will be able to generalize them after I go through the dance examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what you did to learn dance and West Coast swing, you know, applying these theories and techniques. So, as I said, one of the main things was just where is your attention, right? Um, for particularly when I was practicing West Coast swing, I think this applies for any movement practices. Um, I had a particular uh, practicing technique, which was uh, to, whenever I was trying to learn something, I always have to like be uh, putting it on top of whatever I am already doing. Like I'm, I'm interfacing with what I'm doing in order to try and change it to something else. Uh, in order to do that, I have to, um, <clears throat> I have to perform some movement, you know, if I'm going to do some move, I have, to, I have to perform it. Because a lot of it, uh, you know, a lot of the technique lives in my body. It doesn't live, you know, up here. My, there's my concept of some move of what I'm doing, but there's also just like what I actually do. So first I have to get in touch with what I'm actually doing with some movement. And then I like perform it and I watch myself. I don't try and change what I'm doing right away. I have to see what I'm already doing. Um, so that I can use that as my baseline. Okay. What am I actually doing? Um, what is, uh, <clears throat> what is the thing that I want to change about this maybe as well after, after I've done it, I can pay attention to that. And then I can adopt a stance, a stance of, uh, there's stance towards what I'm practicing in order to change it. So it's like, what if I, uh, try and do this move, but I'm going to like try and delay my footwork and then that's, the main thing I'm going to do. Okay, cool. That's like one thing I can try and do to change my technique. What if I try and do it like more staccato, you know? Or what if I do it like as smooth as possible? There's like many directions you can uh, take any kind of movement. Um, and I, I refer to this as kind of like a stance towards the movement. Um, and then you practice that like stance towards the movement on that move. And then you can later see, you know, when you're doing it sort of unconsciously, how does it show up? Uh, so this is, this is another, um, this goes into another thing of like, what are the feedback loops involved in, uh, what you're practicing? So for me, I actually checked what I was doing by watching videos of myself dancing. And there I could see, like, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to hold all these stances in my head of everything that I'm trying to do while I'm dancing. And this, these are social dances I'm talking about. Um, I would film my social dances and, and I would have about an, like half an hour or an hour of data on that. 
uh, that I could watch myself to see for things that, you know, if I was, if the stances I was taking, if I practice actually like came through, um, and that was, that was one feedback loop going on. Another feedback loop that I then implemented is, you know, I would take my dance videos of what I was actually doing, not just my practice. And then I would, uh, I would go to my private, uh, my private lessons with my teacher, the Canadian swing champions, Miles and Tessa, and I, I would show them that and they would give me feedback on what I was happening in my video. And then I would, I would, you know, try and understand what their feedback was. And then there's an additional thing of, if we go back to, you know, what are you actually learning? Um, if I were to practice uh, some kind of uh, difference in the private lesson there, um, I would like know that like this is still not the same context as my social dance. So another sort of principle is um, thinking about what sort of associative context you're in. What are you? Um, like the way that practice is a different context than uh, social dancing is a different context than performing is a different context than private lessons is a different context than a uh, choreo. These are all like different sort of things happening and your brain will separate them. And if you know, if you practice in one, it's not necessarily going to show up in another. So another thing for what you're practicing and you know, what are you actually practicing? You might be practicing to perform a certain thing in your private lesson, but not in your social dancing, which is the thing you actually care about. Uh, this is why it was important for me to film, to see what I was actually doing and then try and go to my private lessons, get feedback. It's sort of like figure out what stances I should try and adopt in my practice, in my social dancing, um, and then do that there and like try and get a handle on it when I was at a private lesson, but not like fooling myself that that private lesson itself was going to uh, correct that or improve my dancing right away. A common pitfall I've seen is People will go to private lessons and then be like, oh, okay, cool. I like, uh, I learned some things. And then they just kind of go social dancing and they, they don't, they don't have a clear like way that their private lessons would feed into their social dancing, into their competitions. Um, whereas, you know, for me, it was like, I would go social dancing. I would film it. I would watch it. I would pick out some things from the dancing. I would show that to my teachers. My teachers would give me something to look for in my videos and to practice. I would then go back and watch my videos to see if I could find more times when I was doing some, uh, doing this thing, or like if I, uh, was, uh, uh, messing up or opportunities, you know, I basically, I was looking for what they were talking about in the private lesson again, and then I would go social dancing. Um, and there I would also have, I, in my social dancing, I would have a, a, I would try and have one stance, just one stance for the whole night, not switching it up too much of like, okay, this social dance, I'm going to focus on paying attention to my partner or like not going crazy and doing too many spins, or I'm just going to be really smooth this whole night, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, then I would watch my videos to see if I actually improved on these things. Um, yeah, I could probably keep going on this for, for a bit. Do you have any questions so far? Yeah. I wonder if there's, there, there may not be, but I wonder if there's anything, um, sort of practical or technical that might be non-obvious about how you set up the recording and storing and reviewing of all these videos. Um, it was a, a bit of a pain. I mostly just have enough storage space to store all the videos. Um, I used my DSLR at the time. I, you know, I put it on a tripod. Uh, I just, I just had to bring my camera to set it up. Um, I did like ask permission at the dance event, like, can I do this? And then I asked permission with everyone I would dance with, like, is it okay if I film? And, you know, sometimes they would say no. So it's like, okay. Um, Uh, aside from that, it's 
you know, I didn't really do anything fancy with the videos. I, I would just store them and then watch them on my computer. Was it hard to set the camera up to record dance? Like I imagine you're moving a lot then. I just wonder about how you framed that, for example. Uh, no, I would just use the zoom lens I had and, you know, set it to as wide as angle as possible. And I didn't always, I wasn't super wide. I wasn't able to capture everything I was doing, but it, you know, it captured 90% of mm -hmm. what I was doing and I had it pointed towards a corner and mm -hmm. I would, I would have that space, uh, for that dance. Um, I, it was in a dark place. I mean, this might be the main technical thing. It was, it was kind of dark. So I think it's kind of dark. So I had a because I had a DSLR, you know, it has enough uh, sensitivity to be able to film. And most, uh, many smartphones, I think, would uh, not quite have enough, uh, maybe some these days. Uh, but I, I, at the time, they definitely didn't, weren't uh, good enough to actually see what was happening. Did you, was this a common practice in the dance world or not, not very no. common? This was very, this is somewhat unusual. It was very common to film competition videos. So mm -hmm. like when you would go to a dance competition, uh, that you would see tons of people, you know, their phones out or some other kind of cameras to uh, capture the social, the dancing there. Um, the unusual thing for me was also filming my social dancing. Uh, and at the beginning, I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't ask permission at the beginning. I, I sort of figured out that like, oh no, I really should be asking permission for this. Like I'm, some people were made uncomfortable by, you know, there being a camera. And uh, this is like, you know, 2014. This is when I was not as sophisticated <laughs> as I am now. So uh, that was another unusual bit that happened, but you know, they were just for me to review. They, they were not getting posted anywhere or anything. Uh, that was their fear. So I eventually talked to people about it. Do you know how you got the idea originally to film everything? Uh, yeah. So basically I was like, I just don't know what I look like when I'm dancing. I have, I've not seen any of my own like good dances. Um, and like very occasionally, uh, some, I would have filmed, someone would have filmed a dance I had at some social dance. Um, and I was like, Hey, this is, this is cool. This is this, this guy. Um, wh what if I did that more? I, it was part of the drive was to yeah, just see my social dance, my like really good social dances to, uh, otherwise it was like they were disappearing or something. Uh, yeah. Was there anything special about how you interacted with your teachers when you were showing them these videos or did they just kind of know what to do and give you feedback? Uh, they're used to like people bringing in their competition videos a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I think was a pitfall there is they, competition videos are a bit strange. Like it's a strange situation. It's not actually the same situation. So this goes back to the associative context thing. Uh, what are you, um, what, what sort of mindset or mood are you in when you are dancing and how competitions are different from social dancing? So, um, I might take in a video from a competition depending on what I did in the competition. Um, but I would also take it. Well, I took in a few videos from, uh, social dancing just to show them. Um, and it's. So, so they're used to seeing videos, um, but like, I, there's a whole different atmosphere and mood around social dancing that you can't get as easily, or it's not, it's, it's just not the same as competition dancing, um, especially if you're a person who has a lot of nerves. Was there anything else that you did, uh, besides recording videos that helped you kind of create these feedback loops? Mm -hmm. I'm having a, having a look at my, my notes quickly. Um, helps me create the feedback loops. 
the main feedback loop I, I have already described, but um, there's there's another one around choreo. Uh, whenever I was learning choreography, um, there's it, you you sort of have to take all these things even more seriously. Um, for for choreography, uh, there's it's like very much memorization and improving, building on a particular memorization sequence of moves. Um, in that one. Uh, if you want to practice like one of the moves in a sequence, uh, you, you, it is sort of useless to practice it on its own in isolation. You need to at least be practicing like starting that move with the move before it. That, and so you can practice the transition into uh, the move you're actually trying to practice and then the transition out of that move into the next move that you're doing. Um, and then you also want to be doing like the whole choreography to practice all the transition as much as possible. Uh, there is, there's a similar feedback loop around, uh, filming there. Um, but there's also another feedback loop around, okay, like once you have this move, uh, down to some degree, uh, what, like looking for next questions of like, how can you actually make this better? And like, one of the easy ways is to go to a private lesson. Um, but another feedback loop you can start introducing is, you know, watching other dancers um, and then comparing them to your own videos. Uh, how do other people, you know, do particular transitions? There's, there's actually, so this goes to like learning languages. Uh, one, one way to learn languages is to just get a lot of like input. You just need a lot of people speaking the language um, a lot of, and like see the context that they're in when they're saying those things. And just so that your brain actually like gets somewhat familiar with all these things. So another thing I did do was just watch a ton of, uh, like high level West Coast swing to see like what I could be doing. And then, you know, comparing that with, uh, my, my own dance videos. Um, now there's a danger there in, uh, a lot of people don't like watching their own dance videos. Uh, you know, they're self-conscious. They think they have various uh, judgments around uh, watching their own videos. I think I somewhat avoided this by just being really curious um, after like two years of not seeing much of my own dancing. Um, and it was like more important to me to be able to see my dancing, to see like what I could put out there than it was to, uh, I don't know, be self-critical. I, and like, I, I guess I got good enough that I surprised myself sometimes. I was like, Hey, that was actually, that was actually good. <laughs> That's this guy. Huh? Um, you know, sometimes I'd also be like, Oh man, that looks, you know, weird. But I, I would have, I've had these days I have about both thoughts about as often like, like that thing's really good. That thing could use some work. Mm -hmm. Um, but it really helps to be able to see what's like good in your own dancing as well. And especially if, you know, you watch your dance videos, you get feedback on them, you work on it, you watch your dance video again, and it actually improved. Mm. And then you're like, oh, okay, I can do this. You know, I can get better. There's another feedback loop of like, you know, motivational feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Which, which includes the, the positive emotion of like satisfaction and appreciation that you have improved specifically. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, just, just uh, one more feedback of... loop, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If, if I can, Please. um, the other, other thing, uh, that you can do in, in dance, this dance in particular, at least is the uh, competition is in some sense, the ultimate judge, mm -hmm. uh, you will, you will get graded, uh, in some sense in competitions and, um, it will be from people uh, other than just your dance teacher. And sometimes depending on how well they know each other, the other, your, your dance teacher might be like, okay, well, I know why this person gave you this score, uh, based on, you know, what happened in this video. Um, and so there's, you know, like how good are you as a social dancer versus how good as you are at competitions and like sort of where do you ultimately rank is one way to view that whole situation. So you can get feedback on like where you stand, uh, in a competition. What is, uh, like just assuming that I know nothing about all of this, how does sort of solitary practice or like solo practice, choreography, social dance, and, 
uh, like practice with a teacher fit together? Like what exactly are those and how do they relate to each other? So social dancing is something that happens uh, usually like once a week, maybe twice a week, depends where you live. Um, it's people just go, they are mostly going for fun. It's everyone who like knows the dance. Sometimes there's a general group lesson beforehand that you can go to. It depends on the venue on the event. Um, it's mostly, you know, it's not serious. People are usually going after work or something. Um, uh, private lessons are something you, know, you sign up for, you show up for uh, an hour and uh, you work on whatever you want to work on. And, uh, you know, th this is another key point is, you know, to figure out what would actually be really good to work on or figure out how to figure out what would actually be good to work on with your teacher. So, you know, I figured out videos would be very helpful to like show something rather than try and reproduce it in person when the context was all different and uh, then have sort of like not a great um, thing for the teachers to latch on to like try and explain to me. Um, so there's so, prior lessons, social sensing, there's solo practice, which uh, there's a lot of solo drills you can do for West Coast Swing in particular. A lot of it is like uh, solo movement. How are you even just, you know, stepping? Um, are you stepping? What is your posture? Uh, what are your, how uh, good are you at spinning? Like you can do spin practice on your own. Uh, there's a lot of footwork things you can do on your own for West Coast Swing in particular. Um, or you can, you know, you can use a, for West Coast Swing, you can use a fridge to like try and uh, test uh, your connection. Um, like your connection is too heavy if your fridge opens and when you're trying to do a move, for example. Um, or like, you know, uh, the opposite, like you have to be able to open the fridge with a certain kind of move if you want to have enough force of a certain kind. There's uh, two different, you know, ways to use the fridge. Um, and then partnered practice or group practice is, you know, something you find a dance partner, uh, someone to practice with, uh, and that can be varying levels of serious. Uh, if you have a a routine that you're doing with someone, uh, that's going to be with someone in particular, and you're going to be practicing choreography. Um, how that works uh, depends on a few things. You might have your own choreography that you make up. You might have someone create choreography for you and then give you a video of um, of the choreography and like, you know, another video breaking it down. Um, uh, that I think that's all the, the different kinds. Does that answer your, any lingering questions there? No, it, that's good. Um, I am curious, though, just adjacent to that, um, if you can just walk me through kind of what your timeline was for, like, I was surprised to hear you say it was, oh, it's like two years into my practice that I started recording these videos. So what was kind of the timeline of when you started and any major like milestones that happened along the way until today? Right, cool. Um, so I've been dancing since July 20, uh 2011, so it's just over 10 years now that I've been dancing. Um, uh, as you, you mentioned at the beginning, I started, I picked it based on, you know, writing a spreadsheet on what are the different physical activities I can do. Um, and there were various uh, categories for that, um, mostly doing to do with social things or things not like directly related, but to the dance, uh, you know, was it competitive? Uh, did it actually exercise? Was it actually uh, exercise? Um, was there a community? Was it fun? Was it you know a skill I could build? And a few other things. Uh, dance is the best. Weightlifting was second best. I did both. Um, partner dance in particular was was the best one. I guess solo dancing might be uh, third on there, uh, but I would might have to recompute some things now because I have a bunch of new. After doing all this, I have a bunch of new criteria. Anyway, so I went to some lessons. I started out pretty casually. I would just go to lessons. And then the social dances were kind of scary for a while. I didn't start going to social dances until around eight months after starting lessons. Um, some people, if they have a friend bring them in, they will have the friend bring them into the social dance as well and like introduce them. And it's a bit, you know, it's a smoother path. Uh, I didn't have that, but I stuck with it anyway. 
um, and I like progressed to the highest level of uh, lessons that were easily available uh, in my place around a year later. Um, and then I went to my first convention a uh, year and a half, about uh, November 2012. And I was like, oh, this is this is the real deal. This is where all the good people are going. This is what it's about. Um, and I took a bunch of videos of my, my dancing then as well. I just took a bunch of photos because this was, you know, this was a novel event. Um, they have a bunch of lessons there at conventions. There's uh, late night dancing. Uh, they have competitions uh, and all the good dancers are there. So that was, that was my first uh, convention. Um, and then, you know, I signed up for the next convention in Vancouver. I, I danced for a bit and I was like, I don't really want to compete yet. I don't feel like I'm good enough to compete. I just want to go to, like, like, cause at a convention, you can basically choose between four things, uh, but you only get three. You got uh, lessons or like, like group, group classes, competitions, social dancing, and sleep. So pick three. Uh, I, I picked, uh, you know, social dancing, lessons, and uh, sleep for a while. Um, so that brings us to around 20, 2013. 2013, I took a bit of a break because I had an injury in my shoulder. And I was like, well, I don't want to, you know, aggravate that. Uh, and then 2014, I feel like the year is like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to learn this thing. I'm going to, this is, this is fun. This is great. There's a whole lot going on here. I'm going to get serious about this uh, in some sense. And this is, you know, after, after taking a break and missing it for a bit and seeing how central it could be in my life. And uh, the friends I was making there actually were also pretty important to me at the time. It was my main social group in Vancouver. Um, so from then on, I started actually taking private lessons with my teachers, Miles and Tessa. And that was, that was a big help. Um, at this point, I had not gotten any points in any competition, um, but I was getting a lot of compliments from people saying like, I was obviously gonna go somewhere with this. And I, I couldn't see that myself. I was like, I don't know, I'm not getting points. I like, I'm not getting to finals even, mm, what's going on? Uh, it turns out I was, I was definitely practicing a lot of things. I just wasn't practicing all of the basics you need to like get beyond the novice stage. Um, I was not really on time. And this is a particularly important thing for West Coast Swing to be on time in a way that's legible to the judges. I was practicing all sorts of like crazy musicality uh, stuff and paying attention to the music. Um, so yeah, my teachers basically were like, okay, so you need to do this to be on time. I was like, okay. And then I, I practiced all that. A few times. I got a few points and, and this is also when I started filming um, a bit later in 2014 after being like, I, I just like, what do you mean I'm not on time? How do I, how do I know that I'm not on time? Um, and then, so I was doing that through 2014 made some more friends. I get to 2015. Um, I had one of, I had my competition where I placed third in a very strange category of, uh, it's called the novice strictly. This is where like you got, you got two people, uh, in you sign up with uh, one person who's a novice and the other person could be whatever rank of any kind. And so I was a novice and I got to dance with an amazing advanced dancer who was fixing all my mistakes and all my timing things. And we got third and I was like, this is great. This is amazing. And I got a video of it. And I was like, this is, this is the dancing I I'm, I'm super proud of. It was great. And <clears throat> I later looked at it and I was like, wow, I was, I am really off time on this whole thing. Like she really fixed all the mistakes I was making. So the, ve the next competition I did, I was like, okay, I'm going to focus on only being on time. This is my like main stance this whole time. I'm going to do simple moves more or less as well. But like the main priority here is just being on time. I don't care what else is happening in the music. Um, so I did that and then I got first. <laughs> it was like, oh, turns out that was the thing I was missing. I had to, was building all these other skills and I was being inspired by watching all these other dance videos and 
having like cool moves, but if I wasn't on time, it like the judges didn't care pretty much. So I got to be, I got on time, I got first. And then from then on, it was like, my points just sort of went shoop. As I, as I learned other things like, um, <clears throat> how to not do too much. This, this, this was another like life lesson sort of thing from dancing was I was doing all these things, uh, in dance and my, my teachers were like, okay, you're just like, you're just doing a lot. There's no break. There's no breath. There's no contrast going on here. And this, this came up at a time in my life when I like felt like I was doing a lot generally. And, uh, this, so I learned to listen to my partner and slow down. Uh, in my dance. And I think this is something that transferred to my life more generally, learning to listen to other people and how to, you know, have conversations. Um, this is sort of the time when I became more, uh, reflective, my having my mirror quality. That's like not particularly showing up here, but this is a very unusual situation, somewhat like last time. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to check in. How is, how is this so far? Great. This... It's great. I'm loving it. Okay. Speaking of, you know, listening and paying attention mm -hmm. to your partner and conversational. Yeah. Um, so 2016 is um, when I started, uh, when I did my choreography, my routine. Uh, this was, this was a big, big project. Um, I spent basically, it was 39 days from the day that we got our choreography and a video from my, our teachers to uh, performing. This was another like lesson about coordination with people. There was like a very clear goal of what we were supposed to do. And at the very beginning, we we're like, wow, we can, we cannot do this. This is extremely hard. These transitions are the, um, and, and then we had to talk to each other about like how to improve our dancing and coordination with one another. Uh, so. This is, this is, you know, like a big relationship test of sorts. Um, and another thing that I feel like transfers over to a life lesson kind of thing of trying to, you know, work with your partner, but also offer criticism or like things that would help or things that they could improve asking for feedback on what you're doing. Um, and like, not just, you know, blaming each other for what's going wrong. And, you know, I was, I was already applying my learning. The, one of the big sort of points of contention was I was applying my learning principles, uh, to it, which also included, you know, like take a rest. You can't just like drill a thing. Um, you need to, it's better to practice in a way where you're actually practicing what you want to practice and not just sort of mindlessly mindless practice will get you nowhere pretty much is was my stance and she was less sure about this uh, we eventually sort of came to the same place on that one but it, it took a bit that was you know some fight um i mean we got fifth place in the first competition we went to and uh that was surprising i was like we got fifth place i guess it's pretty good i don't know um because i th that was the time when i would watch the thing and i was like oh we made all these mistakes and it looks like oh geez and then uh, even while I was used to watching my other videos, choreography is just a whole different beast. Like you, we were comparing the exact moves that we were doing to our teachers doing it, who are champions. They are really good dancers. And it was like, uh, we know what this should look like. Uh, uh, and my very first competition, I had like a stone face on the whole time. I was just very serious doing my moves. And that was like one, one major thing I had to work on was being present with the audience and uh what and like in what i was experiencing was i had like the fun i was having performing for people and in the dance i was a major growth edge throughout that time um at the same time i moved up very quickly through the ranks from we started in when we started the routine i was an intermediate dance um and i pretty quickly went on to become an advanced dancer and kept making finals, uh, throughout the, the next few years. And 
uh, eventually made it to All Stars, which is the current category. I mean, it is like the, the semi pro right before champions category, where you could be teaching dance um, if you want. You get a lot of privileges for being an All Star, but you have to maintain a certain standing, and uh, that's gotten all messed up with COVID. Everywhere. Like the, the standing has been paused at this point. Uh, this. This was also the time I started teaching or learning how to teach from my teachers. Um, and the reason I picked them is uh, because they, they are, <clears throat> the Tessa in particular is also a school teacher. She knew things about learning theory. So she knew how to structure lessons. And I could see that from what I had learned previously about learning. Um, so like one thing she talks about is progressive learning. You have to, there are certain skills you have to build in a certain order. And like, you can't do, you know, step five without having doing the previous four steps. And here are the steps for West Coast Swing in particular. Uh, other teachers are have tended to be more intuitive, which is uh, not my style, but good, good addition, good like, you know, alternate way to like try and think about moves. Um, but I, I wouldn't use it as a base for me. It didn't work for me. Um, and then in 20, 2018, I, I basically started doing a bunch of other things and sort of paused my emphasis on dancing. I went throughout the years, it was like 2014 was like five conventions, 2016, it was like six, and 2017, it was like 10, and then 2018, it was three. Um, and then, you know, 2019, it was one, and then uh, was, it, was it one? It might have been two. And then, you know, 2020, it was, it was one. And then <laughs> 2020 has been zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm curious maybe to dive in a little bit more about what you said about uh, working with your dance partners and also with the teachers that you had. I'm curious if there's anything that you learned about um, language of referring to specific things that were happening or specific movements. Like I know you mentioned that that was part of why you started recording videos was to kind of be able to give your teachers a sense of what you're referring to just by showing them. But I'm curious if there's anything that you learned about speaking about movement through the years that that's been kind of, yeah, any lessons about that? Speaking. Like how to translate movements into, into, into language, into words. Yeah. Just if Something you're like, like Hey, there's this move, you, you know, say you want to say to your partner, Oh, I want to move this way for this choreography. Or you want to say to your teacher, Hey, what did you think about that twirl I did or something? I, I don't know what it would be, but if you want to refer to something that so that you can communicate about it, have you learned anything about how to speak about dance or motion? I mean, a lot of it, I think, is specific-ish to West Coast Swing and dance. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I can refer to this spin. I can refer to uh, an off-axis spin. I can refer to this, uh, you know, certain point of connection or a certain handhold uh, uh, or a, like a timing of some particular move. Um, Texture. Texture is a good word. This is one of my favorite words for this whole thing. Like there's many different ways to texture of movement. And it's it's a bit like, you know, right hemisphere, how this one works. And one sort of easy example that I pointed at earlier was like, am I doing something in a staccato way? Or am I doing it in a more legato way? Uh, I can do the same move, but like, you know, with a different like micro timing there and like that's one example of a texture but you know there, there's also you know are you going like up are you going down uh when you do this the same movement um are you doing a you know a small version of it um there's like many ways you can point at a particular kind of texture but you know the whole sort of you the big bubble that those all exist in is in like texture so that's that's one word that i've really come to like um, that almost sounds like, like adjectives for words or something, but for motion, does that seem like a yeah. fair comparison there? Yeah. Um, and you, you, <clears throat> you always have to demonstrate what you're doing at the same time. Like you, mm. you can't just, 
you you can just use the word, but it's it, uh, <laughs> you really want to be able to demonstrate what you're trying to do. Um, and it it also helps a lot if you're whenever you're describing some kind of difference uh, to like you know display a difference. You have to do it do some move both ways uh, in that are contrasting against each other to point out something that you want to point at mm. uh, much of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about uh, that point about language or your trajectory with dance in general? Mm. Not, not right now, I think. Um, yeah, I'm curious then about, you mentioned, uh, that if you, if you were to update your spreadsheet, you've added some new criteria, what would some of those criteria be? <clears throat> I mean, I would have to add something to where my investments currently are in dance. Uh, like what one category would be just like compatibility with my current dance paradigm. Uh, so salsa is is like the wrong foot um and it uses a different technique where you're you're not um, as physically connected you're more doing a signaling thing um and uh, and the timing is a little strange so that, that would be one example where like salsa would not work in particular because it like is sort of too close um and the wrong it's too close and different whereas you know something like uh karate would be not too close um, and still has the whole stance thing. It might even improve my West Coast swing. So there's there's something like, you know, compatibility would be uh, one, one sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, being able to go to conventions and travel and go around the world is another really big one. Uh, basically, most cities around the world I can travel to and I can make friends pretty quickly just by going to a dance event. And, uh, you know, people also want to make friends with the good dancers. And I like I'm good enough that people uh, want to make friends with me. And so that's, that's a really cool benefit of West Coast Swing in particular. Um, like you can sort of do this with the rationalist movement. You might be able to do this with Twitter stuff. Um, you might, and there's, there's a few other movement practices you could do this with. Uh, I wouldn't know as much about them, how to do that, but it seems, seems definitely possible. I would want to like look into that. Um, some of them are kind of too common or something. Uh, like weightlifting doesn't have as much, depending on where you go, doesn't have as much of a community versus like, you know, salsa's friggin' everywhere, uh, much more so even than West Coast Swing. Like there's, there are places where there, there isn't any West Coast Swing. Uh, there's very few places there is not salsa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, those are the main ones that come to mind so far. It's like categories that I figured out existed after I did West Coast Swing. So, I mean, that also... Uh, raises the question of like, what are the other categories that I'm not thinking of because I'm not doing other movement practices out there mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would invent a new category for me that I might care about? That's that's you know, something to ponder. Yeah, I've um, for a lot of this conversation, I mean, the frame of this has been about dance, but I'm uh, also keeping in mind that my own current movement goal or one of them relates to learning the soon Tai Chi form and a lot of it cross applies and yeah I'm, I'm kind of imagining now that that would have some categories that might not be on your spreadsheet uh, i mean it might not be the thing for you but uh just kind of came to mind um yeah so yeah i mean some some category you might have is like what sort of mindset does this hmm. uh movement practice get you into i had a very you know basic version of this of like is it competitive and wisco swing is not competitive in the relevant way it is like largely, even in a competition, it's a cooperative experience with one other partner. This is why it, you know it sort of slides by on that versus like a team sport where you know your I don't know football would be particularly aggressive and like you know, screw the other team. Um, you know Tai Chi though, in terms of a mindset, um, as you said you, earlier, practicing uh, loving kindness while you're uh, doing some movement form, for example. I, I'm not quite sure how you, how you have it all set up, but um. That that would definitely uh, you know that, that has an, an impact and influence. Um, for some people, uh, West Coast Swing is their like you know release. This is where they get to be expressive um, throughout their day. This is where you know they can practice being more free and expressive. 
Um, it's a different different kind of meditation sort of experience there. Mm -hmm. um, it's it might also be a bit, you know about connecting with others versus something with Tai Chi might be you know connecting with yourself more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm curious. I asked you last time if you had to start a new movement practice, what it would be. And I'm, I believe you mentioned weightlifting and we might come back to that, but I'm curious to ask if you were to start a new movement practice, but it was a, a different style of dance, let's say not salsa, but something that was sort of compatible, but different than West coast. Um, you know, whatever it is, it, I mean, I'm sure it would matter what it is, but just assume it's something that you're interested mm -hmm. in learning and fits your criteria. Um, how would you go about, you know, say you knew you had another 10 years to focus on this new one, how would you go about doing that? And would it be different in any way than the way you approached West Coast Swing the first time around? Yes, I, th I think I would, it would probably be Zucker Tango. Mm -hmm. These are dances that I'm like sort of vaguely familiar with. I could pull them off, but I'm like, I don't feel at all as competent as I do in West Coast Swing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would make friends a lot faster than I did. Uh, it took me a few years basically to make friends uh, in West Coast Swing. Um, I would make friends. I would try and find a practice partner or a group of people practicing much sooner. Um, like I would, I would focus even more on the community than I did. Um, I would still do, you know, the filming thing. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, I would still go to private lessons. Um, I, I think a big thing I would have to do is something like updating my own evaluation of how good I am at dancing because the, there's being as good as I am in West Coast Swing in particular, I sort of expect to be that good at all dancing and that is not the case. So there's an, there's an additional hurdle here for me of like being okay, being even more of a beginner than I'm used to being. I, I, I have already, you know, some amount of a beginner mindset, but uh, in my experience, it has not been enough to, it's not as much as I would like uh, to uh, be able to actually learn this thing without like, oh, I should be able to do this coming up, um, especially in a social dance situation. Like I, I think lessons are all right where I like basically don't expect to know it. Uh, re really practicing like a beginner mindset I think is, is another is the big thing there. Um, yeah, make friends, have a practice partner group lessons, uh, private lessons, filming, beginner mindset, um, watch a lot of videos. I didn't quite mention this as much, but watching videos as one form of input was something I did, not just like my own videos, you know, professional videos, see what's out there. It took me a long time to find conventions for West Coast Swing and to see, like, it was at least a year before I saw any professional West Coast Swing that was at a high level. Um, so I know to look for uh, what, what are the high level dancers doing? Where are they? Where are the conventions? I go to those much sooner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is something I would probably do anyway, but there's also like getting a sense for the culture and who, who's part of this movement, I guess, like, you know, relating to mindset, um, the mindset of each dance is, you know, the sort of people who show up are, are different. Uh, one reason I kind of don't like salsa as much is also that's kind of, uh, has this macho attitude a little bit, very, you know, rigid gender roles kind of attitude that I'm like, mm, mm -hmm. I want to be able to follow as well, you know? Mm-hmm. How do you think you would choose uh, Zook versus Tango? Um, probably availability. Like how well does it fit into the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. it's sort of a somewhat, not exactly boring answer, but a, an answer that is uh, subject to other things, which is not, I mean, you got to fit dance somewhere into your, your life. Um, you can make dance your life. I did that for a bit. I don't regret that at all. 
Um, if you if I was gonna if you were gonna make dancer life, you you would want to go to you know what you actually care about in the criteria. But in my case, it would be just what's available wherever I am. Um, in my case, in Vancouver, I know that there's <clears throat> I know there's both communities here. Um, I'm you know on the periphery of them. I know they exist. Uh, I have not checked out the Tango one quite as much, um, and that it would probably be more the mind the mindset thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the mindset and like what sort of people are the community with? Like t Tango has a bit of a reputation for being snobby, so I'm a bit wary of that. For example. Mm -hmm. I think you wanted to mention something previously. Do you remember what that was? Uh, I, I have a, somewhat of a unrelated to stuff we've been talking about point that I've has been sitting in the background. Um, Please. For, for any, for any listeners, um, who are also thinking about how to practice a movement practice, um, one very important part of the whole process is to figure out what you want from dance. Um, this is, you know, why I made a spreadsheet. Um, but if, you know, if you're clear on why you're doing this dance in the first place, you will have a much better motivational base for actually getting better if that is something you want to do. Some people want to just uh, chill in a dance or just have you know a fun social activity to go to that's like lessons, but they're not like particularly interested in getting like really good at the dance. Um, West Coast Swing has a bit of uh, attitude around it. Part of the culture is like, everyone wants to get better at West Coast Swing. So at least this is the social group I'm part of uh, in West Coast Swing. Um, but you want to make sure that, like, that you actually want to get better and you actually want to spend the time doing that. Uh, it's totally fine to not want to get too much better and just have, have fun. That's another goal you can have uh, with your uh, dance or movement practice. Um, yeah, and ask, ask, ask yourself those questions. Um, like, so part of the reason... I got better is I really wanted to get better because I could see what was possible out there uh, and I wanted to be, I wanted to be good and not everyone does. And it's like, you don't, you don't want to compare yourself to people who have different goals and different priorities in life. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not going to become a champion. I already know this, this, that's way too much time investment for me. There's a lot of other things I care about. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm curious uh, how to put this. If you were to learn a new movement practice that's not dance, like weightlifting, which you mentioned in the previous one conversation, or or say something else like, you know, I was like, okay, you've got 10 years and you have to learn Sun Tai Chi, uh, something that's not dance. Um, I assume you'd use some of the principles that you've already mentioned of like finding a community, you know, yeah, knowing why you're doing it, also recording, you know, working with teachers, maybe adding a competition element if there was like that. But is there anything that would be different about something that's not dance about, say you knew you were gonna do weightlifting or Tai Chi or something else, like a different way that you would approach that that wouldn't apply to dance? Mm -hmm. I mean, weightlifting um, has a whole element of uh, nutrition and uh, eating that's also relevant that's like pretty um in some sense separated from the actual movement itself in a way mm -hmm. that uh, dance doesn't really have i mean like of course you know nutrition and uh you know sleep are important for dance but they're not like central in the same way um like if you don't eat enough when you're weightlifting you just aren't going to get stronger beyond a certain point pretty much mm -hmm. um and so there's there's something there's something there about like what to do differently uh, mindset wise. Um, hmm. but that wouldn't apply to dance. I mean, I think Tai Chi. It, I so I don't know enough about Tai Chi. I feel, but I I feel like there's there are like slightly different goals in Tai Chi. They're more related to uh, mindset and like. Uh, knowing yourself is one way I want to put it. Um, being in touch with your own energy or something. This is like my stereotype. I don't know. This is like a straw man. I, I don't quite know. You might be able to say more about that. Um, 
so it's more like solo focused um solo dance would have this in a certain aspect but it would still it still feels you know different in a certain way in that it involves uh targets and uh you know to a certain music um timing etc it feels like uh tai chi in my sense of it is more has less external constraint, mm -hmm, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's usually classified as like an internal martial art where there are martial arts that are focused on, uh, you know, at, attacking other people and physical force, but it is an internal martial art. So it's still a martial art. It has martial applications. And that's something I'm not quite clear on myself, but it seems like all of the moves could be used in, in say some kind of fight. Um, I don't know. I haven't been in a fight since learning Tai Chi or <laughs> even really before, but uh, that's something I want to learn more about. But I'd say, yeah, the, the focus is on uh, like awareness of oneself, one's body, one's breath, muscular tension, relaxation, grace of movement, energy flow, especially energy flow. And, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of, I, I see it. I mean, I don't know how an actual Tai Chi teacher would describe it, but I see it as a form of energy work that you're basically doing on yourself by going through the motion, like things happen in my energy body and start to flow. And I imagine there's, you know, higher and higher levels of being able to use that skillfully. And um, yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole other dimension as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the this, this summary to the <clears throat> question of what I would do different is basically I would, and probably because I have different goals in that movement practice in particular. Um, so if I were to do, you know, if I were to do weight, weightlifting, I would be focusing maybe more on, um, you know, strength or, uh, you know, more general fitness. And this requires, uh, you know, this requires changes to other parts of my life such that, you know, for example, I can have the nutrition I need for that, which means like maybe not eating out, uh, socially. Um, and, you know, there's certain trade-offs there. Uh, if I were to do contra dancing or, or sauce, if I were to do them, it would probably be more of a social thing and less of a skill thing. And, uh, so I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't focus as much on the skill stuff. I would just try and, you know, get to know people or uh, be able to, you know, build more of a community around, uh, contra dancing. Cause like you know, contra dancing, as far as I understand, is pretty easy to pick up on, on like West coast swing. Um, so it's a, it's like, I would do it differently and it depends on my, what my goals are in that scene mm -hmm. right that makes a lot of sense so start with knowing why you're doing what you're doing and then yeah it all falls downstream of that pretty much perfect perfect um, yeah i imagine a lot of the tactics that you've mentioned of like video recording and you know community and working with a teacher would still apply but yeah knowing why you're doing something seems primary mm -hmm. uh, so that's really helpful uh, I, I i do want to mention one more thing about the videos in particular mm. um when I was, when I've been watching videos, especially of other people, um, there's like two different ways to be watching videos, or there's at least two different ways. Uh, one, you can be, you know, watching them sort of passively be like, oh, this, this person's doing cool moves or whatever. There's a sort of like, there's a passive thing of a person over there is doing uh, these movements. Um, and there's a more active version. And this is how I think I learned a lot from videos is like when I see, you know, the leader in this dance or the follower, depending on what I'm trying to learn, but usually the leader, when I see them doing, well, I see them at all, I'm watching them. I am imagining in my own body what it feels like to do the moves that they are doing. Uh, and this is, this is, this is basically a practice. This is, this has been uh, shown in other things where like, if you imagine the movement, uh, I think for basketball, this is where it was shown. If you imagine shooting, um, like even when you're just like in bed or whatever, you imagine that movement, that's, uh, that, that is practice. Uh, it turns out like you actually do, you can improve just imagining practicing some kind of movement. Hmm. And so one way to pick up on uh, what these, you know, really good dancers are doing is seeing what they're doing and imagining yourself doing it and imagining how that feels to do it. Mm. Um, and then having some familiarity when you actually try and do it, sort of what it should feel like, how smooth it should be with the timing of it 
is that like you sort of implicitly get all these things in your brain a little bit. So I, I found like sometimes I pick up moves very quickly when I've you know already seen them a bunch, but I like didn't actually know how to do it myself versus like a move I've never seen. I'm like, I don't even know what, how I should. This is also when I was doing karate, when I was 10, I was learning faster than I should have. And I had a bit of an authority problem. Um, so I wanted to do forms sooner than I should have known how to do them. And I like memorized the whole sequence just by watching. Hmm. Um, and part of, I think how I did this was when I was watching, I was like, okay, here's, you know, the movement in my head sort of while I'm sitting down being like, it would feel like this to do that. And then it happens, this little bit happens next. Hmm. What do you mean that, uh, like you were learning them faster than you should have, that there was something you said there that I didn't quite understand. There's, um, there's a certain pace you in the school I was in the, there's a certain pace you're supposed to go through. You know, if you're a green belt, you're supposed, you're not supposed to learn, you're, you're supposed to learn up to form three, but you're not supposed to learn form four. Um, if the teacher doesn't think you're ready mm -hmm. is part of that. But like what makes the teacher think you're ready was kind of more of a business decision than it was mm -hmm. a competence decision. That was the mm -hmm. bit that I was rebelling against. It was yeah the the sort of business of getting people through different mm -hmm. belt levels and learning things versus just like are we here to learn karate or what mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was my attitude mm -hmm. were there any uh side effects of that uh, i think that was a side effect of my um upbringing mm -hmm. sort of like a, the you know other things in my life where when i went through school I had a bit of an authority problem there too, where, you know, if the teacher said to do something that I didn't want to do that I thought was dumb, I like wouldn't do it. And, uh, I'm not sure that that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it did have consequences. Um, I, so I sometimes get this counter will, mm -hmm. uh, impulse a lot of the time when someone tells me to do something these days, mm -hmm. it's like, you should, you know, Anyone, anytime anyone's, you should da 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 da, and I like don't see the reasons behind it. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> I won't listen to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, I'm aware of this, and so it's like this comes up. And I'm like, mm, okay, hold on. But so I, I mean, um, so, so that's interesting. I, I meant uh, specifically with karate that you tried to learn things in advance. Like, it, you know, if it was just a business decision, it probably didn't matter so much. But were there any side effects to learning it too quickly or anything like that? So I don't have videos of myself doing that. <laughs> I don't think I actually have a way to know. Uh -huh. um, sure. But the story I have is I was a good learner and uh, all the achievement things, all the data I did have was that I was good at it and I was better than the other kids. Mm -hmm. um, they had, you know, a special rank called Elite Warrior, which was, you know, you can get a normal belt. But if you like did all the things you're supposed to do really well, you get you know, yellow belt elite warrior. And so I, I never didn't get elite warrior. Mm -hmm. I was like student of the month, two months after I got there. Uh, hmm. I thought it was good. I, I can't prove it. I I'm not sure even because of not seeing myself on video, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't, there was no side effects as far as I know of like learning a thing too fast. I, I just, I was just good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes, I mean, um, you know, maybe in like, say weightlifting, for example, there might be a reason that someone says, don't oh, do yeah. this too quickly. Like you're going to injure yourself or something like that. So I was just curious about does that. does not apply to all movement practices for sure. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Um, you know, some are more dangerous. Um, there, yeah. Like in, in karate, there could be, I can imagine side effects of like, you know, you're learning to throw people or, or something sooner than if you if you're doing that before you learn to you know be thrown mm -hmm. uh that's like mm, that's a little not very mm -hmm. i would have questions mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um that's the main one that comes to mind mm -hmm. uh, but i i didn't do that i they're they're pretty good about like you learn to you know roll and uh be thrown uh pretty pretty quickly in that school they, they mm -hmm. get the safety stuff pretty out there mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about just kind of your own learning of dance in the past or a hypothetical learning track in the future? The thing I'm learning now more is um, teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and how teaching influences what you what your own understanding of the dance even is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this there's this other thing about if you want to learn something really well, teach it. I think it's Feynman who who said this. Mm -hmm. he, a bunch of other people have also said it, but I, he's the one I remember saying it. Um, definitely learning the frameworks for teaching and trying to convey to other people what you're even doing in this dance as opposed to merely understanding it yourself uh, will uh, it will break your brain mm -hmm. a little bit in a good way where you can then get a more solid understanding of what you're actually doing um, There's there's more to say about that I think and it's not quite yet available. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Um, I'd be curious to dive into a, a specific sort of line of questioning around. Um, you know, I sort of asked you what you would do differently if you were mm -hmm. learning a new movement practice, but I I thought it might be interesting to share maybe the two things that I'm doing with movement yeah. practice and see if you have any comments about them or how you would frame them. Cool. Um, so maybe I'll actually start with the Tai Chi and then move to dance. Uh, describing the Tai Chi bit feels a little bit simpler to me, um, mm -hmm. just to start there, even though it's a little bit more far afield. Um, Great. I, I want the challenge. All right. I welcome uh, the challenge. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's see. I have been interested in the internal martial arts as a complement to practice for some time. I've wanted to have some kind of movement practice to complement my extensive experience with seated meditation. Um, they seem to be mutually supportive and, and often in Buddhist traditions, they'll talk about walking meditation, but I think the Taoists are really onto things with you know Qigong and Tai Chi and uh, there's other forms as well, like Bagua and Xingyi. And, um, you know, there's also yoga, of course, which I've done some of and enjoyed, but um, a couple of years ago, I started doing standing meditation, Junjuang, which is traditionally considered to be a, a preparation for all of the internal martial arts, including Tai Chi, but also Qigong. And um, yeah, that has been really powerful for me doing standing meditation. And so my interest was in uh, developing skill in Tai Chi after that, since it was sort of like a prerequisite for Tai Chi. And uh, yeah, so right now with my Tai Chi practice, there's there's a, you know, there's different forms of Tai Chi. There's like five or six major different forms. And I'm learning one called the Sun Tai Chi form, sort of like a style of dance, but with Tai Chi. Um, and it has like 14 sections and the whole form takes about eight minutes to complete when you've finished learning it. And uh, some of them repeat. So I think there's two sections that repeat that I've sort of already learned, but haven't put into sequence yet. And I'm on the seventh of the 14, which is actually supposed to be the most complicated in the whole form. And uh, so a little bit over halfway through, um, especially if you count the ones that repeat. And my initial goal has just been to learn the form, like learn the basic movements, which uh, I'm under the impression will take me something like six, nine, 10 months, something like that. And uh, I've been doing it since like March of this year. And um, yeah, and then after that, I plan to ideally practice it every day for the rest of my life, really do that eight minute form every day for the rest of my life. It's one of the advantages of Sun Tai Chi in particular is that like you, with pretty minimal adjustments, you can do it past say the age of 60. Uh, whereas other ones, you have to make pretty major adjustments if you want to do when you're sort of older. Uh, but I should be able to do this like theoretically till I'm like 100 or something, um, you know, assuming good health and can still move and stuff. And, and of course, that's one of the benefits of the internal martial arts is that they are, you know, sort of good for preserving your health. Um, and so young people don't typically do them, but then like older people start to see the value of like, oh, yeah, these, mm -hmm. these will help me stay mobile and uh, fluid and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, so I'm kind of in the stage where I'm just learning the form and that's my, that's my main goal is just like, just learn the absolute basics of the whole form. And then, um, I have a sense that there's sort of like a skill tree or progression after that, but I don't even really know what they are. Um, I, I know what they might involve things like relaxation and energy and 
where you're holding your awareness in your body and things like this, but um, you know, the, the fluidity of motion and things like this, but um, yeah, right now my goal is just learn the form and then uh, kind of check in after that. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of my plan with Tai Chi is, is all of that. Okay, well, I have a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that you saw that there's probably a skill tree. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the skill tree is, mm -hmm. um, but the fact that there probably is a skill tree, good thing to notice. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, my first question, I guess, is how would you know when you have learned the forms? Like, what, how do you know you're not there yet? Mm -hmm. Well, um, basically, I go to a class once a week. Um, and we learn one or two new moves and there's a and like whole... when you say we learn like what does that process actually look like yeah basically there's an hour class and the teacher at the beginning like goes through everything that we've learned of the form so far and then he'll like add like one. they they demonstrate it or they you do it with them or you do it with how them does that work you do it with them okay so you like review uh while doing it at the same time the things that you've done previously that's exactly right. Okay. Um, and like all at once, or do you do like part one, part two, part three? How does that? How does that all go? at once? Yeah, you do it in, in sequence the whole thing up okay. to that point. Um, it, it seems to me that like some part of my cardio experience here is going to be very relevant. So your what experience? Part of where my, my choreography experience, I my see. routine experience. Yes, yes, definitely like choreography. Um, not that I've done much of that in a dance context, but it, it does seem very similar. Um, yeah, and then he adds in like one or two new moves and then splits us off. It's on Zoom, which is kind of unfortunate. Ideally, I'd be doing it, you know, in person, but it's also nice because I, you know, for, for Tai Chi, it seems like it would work better than it would for partner dancing. <laughs> that's definitely much. true. That's definitely true. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then he splits off. There's one other person that like started at the same time that I did. And so he puts me and this other guy into a breakout room and we practice together for like 10 or 15 minutes. And then while well, he's kind of teaching the higher levels and then he comes back and then at maybe checks with us, asks if we have questions. And then depending on the day, he might add like one or two new moves at that point as well. And then for the rest of the week, I make sure to practice the form once a day and just kind of like integrate the things that I learned in the previous class. So like, and when you say integrate the things you learned, do you mean the like new movements? Uh, That's in right. particular? That's okay. right. And so right now the goal is just like adding bits onto the choreography until you can do the whole thing at once. Yeah, yeah. And that, there's not too much say? focus on like any of the like technical aspects or depth of it. It's just like learn the absolute basics of it and right. uh, internalize those. I mean, it seems to me a better way to do this was, would be to simply have a video of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is how I would like to, to learn it. He actually um, did send a video of, actually, interestingly, not the whole thing. It has everything but the seventh section, which I mentioned is the hardest one. Yeah, I guess he thinks that you shouldn't have a video for that one for reasons that aren't completely clear to me, but he like wants us mm -hmm. to learn that without the video. Uh, but he did send a video of that that is a reason thing. to be curious about you know why mm -hmm. why the teacher does think that um, mm -hmm. it seems to me not clearly like oh you should just have the seventh bit like, <laughs> that's yeah. that's how I feel but you know uh, yeah you know it's fine um, you'll I'm see grateful you'll, for you... the other parts of the videos so mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm curious if you know it does end up being like ah uh, yeah you probably shouldn't try and learn this before or some other thing or or something whatever whatever it is whatever the reason is I'm curious mm -hmm. me uh, too me too yeah. Yeah. Um, so the feedback, you, you don't really get a lot of feedback. It sounds like you mostly just, there's a social aspect to it where like everyone's doing it. So there's a particular time to be doing it. You have uh, daily practice. Um, but as far as I can tell, the teacher doesn't like tell you, he doesn't tell you any of the technical things very much, uh, if at all, uh, about how they do some of the movements. Just I mean, like he does, he does when he's teaching it. it. But but I as I say, I suspect there's like more depth. So he, he talks about the absolute basics of it. And I'm sure he could talk in more depth, but, um, you know, uh, yeah. And then I do, so I've done one private lesson with him. And then I also, um, his 
my his teacher is also my teacher and friend so I occasionally talk to his teacher and so uh, when I talk to him I usually go through the form and get feedback as well and then I've also been I've done this twice now that I've recorded everything that I've learned and put it on my YouTube channel if only so I can track my progress over time I haven't made too much use of that yet but have gotten some video of me doing it um I, another thing that I would have done is taken more videos earlier on mm -hmm. in my dance career just to mm -hmm. see the like progress more clearly, even if I wasn't going to look at the first video for a year. Mm -hmm. Because if you've taken that video and then you dance for a year and you get better, and then you look at the first video, you're like, oh, I really got better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, totally. So it's good that you have videos. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Watching them. Mm -hmm. oh, what's your experience of watching the videos? Mm, yeah, I have a bit of what you sort of alluded to other people having of like, I don't like watching it. It's, it's not very graceful or beautiful. And, uh, uh, yeah, I can get pretty picky of like, oh, I'm sure this should be better. And then, and then typically like there's parts of it that like I get confused about and I need to like polish more. I, I think I should be spending a bit more time like polishing specific movements, which is tricky right now of course, because I'm in the seventh section, which as we mentioned, we don't have video, of, but, uh, yeah. um, but yeah, like if I see those specific parts, I'm like, oh, this isn't that great, but, um, yeah, so it's, it's a little bit challenging emotionally, not, not like terrible, but not my favorite. Common issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I should um, mention as well that I'm doing one thing I'm doing as well is I've got a long running thread on my Twitter account of like just journaling about different things that I noticed. And I've really been enjoying that. I was, was going to ask about. Yeah. They're pretty short because they're all tweets, but um, it's it's enough of like a pointer to specific things. That's like enough granularity for me, at least at this stage. Mm -hmm. Now I was going to ask about like in a journal, uh, like what, what, what do you have in your journal for either skills or like your mood during it? Um, mm. Something about mood seems relevant because of, you know, the, uh, what, what you, what, um, seems to be the goal of some part of Tai Chi, um, relates to like, like movement, mood, mood and energy and, you know, well being mm -hmm. to some extent. So that would be like another bit of mm. something to keep track of or like, I'm not quite sure how it interfaces, but it seems relevant. Yeah. To keep track of all of those things. Um, yeah. Like I noticed typically in the last few weeks. You know, I mentioned I try to practice everything in the days in between and like typically the first few days of the week I'm focusing on just the very technical like what was the movement again like did I get that right and kind of going over that and then usually towards the end of the week it's sort of internalized enough that I I like I'm trying to work over time on like the gracefulness or the fluidity of the motion and so I've by towards the end of the week I've internalized the new movements enough that I can like focus pretty exclusively on just am I moving like slowly and gracefully in a relaxed way to the extent that I know how to right now? Mm -hmm. Do you um, do any sub-skill practice for any of these things or do you only practice within the form? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the only thing I'm working on besides the form is like this fluidity of motion thing. Uh, I'm not aware of anything else right now that's sort of a, I mean, sometimes, oh, so sometimes, yeah, uh, after I did my private lesson or when I talked to my other teacher, uh, there were specific points that I would focus on as kind of a stance, as you mentioned, of like, um, like, for example, there's, there's like a full step versus a half step, and those are different. And at the beginning, I wasn't getting the half steps right. So for like a week or two, I focused mm. on having the stance of like making sure I'm doing the, the half steps right, as opposed to the, um, you know, the way I was doing them before. Mm -hmm. And and so the the fluidity thing sounds like a you know some kind of sub skill and something in the skill tree, mm -hmm. um, and you can practice that sort of separately uh, in isolation somehow mm -hmm. um, from the, the form itself. Yeah, and that's just something I've sort of set and discovered for myself of like oh I want to be working on this like especially because it applies to uh, the dancing as well which we might talk about in a minute but like a lot of the dancing that I feel. Um, most comfortable doing, I'd say is very like 
like uh, linear and like like rectilinear and and sort of staccato as you said. Whereas like it's nice to be able to do like more flowing, smooth, relaxed motions as well. And they're just not as like comfortable or familiar for me. So and Tai Chi mm -hmm. is a great place to be practicing yeah. that because it's all flowing and yeah. Seems so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what what do you have? The the one of the big generators of the questions that I have here is, you know, where is the feedback coming from? Mm -hmm. Um so so far there's there's your teacher in private lessons. Um you don't unlike partner dance, you don't really have a partner for more like extremely direct feedback. Yeah. It's very internal. Um, it could so, be possible if I like lived with someone or lived near someone else who was doing the form, but I, I don't right now. And it is COVID times as well, of course. Uh -huh. I, I sort of mean partner in two senses. One is mm -hmm. like, you know, someone who can you know tell you something about how you're doing, but there's also a thing in partner dancing where part of how a partner is able to tell you something is they're also interfacing directly with you mm -hmm. and have mm -hmm. their own mm -hmm. experience of mm -hmm. your movements. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, if it's more of a solo thing, it's just like, oh, this is what I see. Mm -hmm. It's not quite the same resolution. So this is why I was thinking, okay, well, you want to probably want to focus more on the journal here. Mm. Um, and I imagine in your journal, you've like written down or, uh, the, uh, the things that came up in your private lesson, the specific sub skills to practice, like the, the half step thing. Is that right? Um, not necessarily in the Twitter one that I mentioned that felt a little too granular, but I do have notes about that in in my personal notes. Right. So th that's, that along with the mood journal, the, uh, mm -hmm. why, I don't know, There's something about having as many internal feedback loops as you can, because that seems mm -hmm. to be the focus mm -hmm. of it would, is mm. seems pretty important. And I, I'm not quite sure how to develop all of those for Tai Chi in particular and how those like interface with the journal. Um, but because well, I have that a seems sense to of that to some extent, like, especially because, I mean, I, you know, obviously on the one hand. I haven't done Sun Tai Chi before, and I'm not like a Taoist expert or a Taoist master. But on the other hand, I have done extensive like Buddhist practice and meditation training, and right. I have kind of a sense that of how to cross apply those lessons into the Tai Chi. Not in a way that uh, at least the main teacher that I'm working with on a weekly basis has like pointed to, but I'm like, oh yeah, I should be, you know, like following my breath and be relaxed, and you know these kinds of things, or paying attention to the energy flow, or noticing patterns there, that kind of thing. So it seems like you're on your way. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm curious what you're getting from what I've said so far that like might be new or uh, notable that I like mentioned or something. Then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's, you reflected some things about things I was already doing. Like, oh, I, I hadn't really made the connection that I don't like watching the videos or like I could probably take more videos or, um, you know, I'm realizing I've just had one private lesson and that was partly possible because I was like geographically near the the guy that I'm learning from when I'm not right now. But, um, you know, also that I could journal about the internal stuff and my sense of that and kind of, yeah, having more internal feedback loops like what you mentioned. And um, I, I will have to think about how to implement that technically, but like I, you're pointing in a direction that's pretty clear to mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, would it be interesting to you to do the same thing with how I'm thinking about dance? Yeah, dance would probably be much more straightforward. It might be. I mean, uh, there is okay. the whole dimension of me adding in contemplative practice to it, uh, which... That seems very compatible to me. Yeah, yeah, De definitely, definitely. It's just, you know, I don't know of anyone that's doing precisely the thing that I'm trying to do or the things that I'm trying to do, and I'm sort of teaching myself how to do that, so... Right, so um, I'm very curious. Tell me yeah. all about it. Okay, great. Your dance and your com contemplative practice. Part of that. Yeah. Um, so the first thing to say is uh, I, I'm really not trained in dance. Mostly I've done, I did a little East Coast swing back in the day in college, but just a little bit. And then I took some dance classes actually at the monastery. That's a whole story. But, uh, and then I did, uh, I've done actually a bit of like a, a moderate level of, of contact improv, you know, maybe like. 20 hours of contact improv or something. But basically I, I'm, I'm not at all trained in dance formally. And then at a certain point um, I started just dancing for fun on my own. And 
uh, you know, just putting some music on and dancing. And then it quickly became really clear to me that one, it was fun. And two, it was relatively easy to bring in the different practices that I was trying to do anyway, in a way that was like, yeah, I mean, frankly, more engaging for me and enjoyable than like, say, seated practice or, you know, other forms of practice. Like at this point in my own training, um, how to put it, I, I guess I have a lot of, to, to be frank, I have a lot of aversion to seated practice. I, ca I can do it no problem for hours, days, weeks, but like, I don't like it. Mm. <laughs> I don't enjoy it. And that's, that's sort of a, a problem if you want to get deeper in meditation. And so, um, you know, I do, I, I work around that. I do standing practice, which I love. I do lying down practice. Walking is great, but I don't do so much of it. And then, you know, I do a lot of what they call life practice where, you know, the, in a podcast, for example, I'm trying to integrate various aspects of my practice into the experience. Um, but dancing is like, the best. <laughs> I have no mm -hmm. problem motivating myself to dance and bring the practice in. And then, um, so there's a few things there. One is on the one hand, internally, there's a number of techniques that I do that I try to incorporate and I might focus more on one than another on a given day. Uh, there's loving kindness practice. There's like kind of what I would call imaginal practice. Um, there's sort of just body awareness and breath awareness and awareness of energy and things like that. Um, there's also, and relaxation and tension and things like that. And uh, yeah, and then there's also some element of like bringing in say Tai Chi into it. Like I, I've explored that a little bit. And then on the other hand, I have this whole uh, endeavor to, I don't know, inspire people with my dancing to do what I'm doing specifically to bring these practices and especially loving kindness practice into dance. And so, you know, maybe you saw the, the music video that I made, which, yeah. you know, the dancing is anyone that knows anything about dancing is going to be like, this is just a guy dancing, but like the, 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 the bringing the loving kindness into it, I think is, you know, I'm sure people have done it before, but relatively rare. And that's, that's really the point for me is like, ideally I would both dance beautifully in a way that's inspiring to people and be doing you know, these contemplative practices while dancing at a, at a pretty high level. Uh, how, how would you say the, the practices relate to what I called uh, the stances mm -hmm. uh, when I was talking about my experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they relate great. I mean, some days I might, um, like I've had sessions where my stance is like, okay, there's these two or three Tai Chi moves. Can I learn how to dance with them and sort of spice them in or um, can I, uh, I know a lot of, I'd say 80% of the time, the default technique is doing loving kindness. So I might focus on one day on, um, sending loving kindness to the people that are physically around me or on visualizing people that aren't there or, um, you know, really feeling the feelings of loving kindness while I'm dancing or noticing the ways that my body wants to move to express this love. Those are all stances that I've played with. There are other ones as well. Um, certainly There's many with... variations on, on that, that, uh, that one in particular. Exactly. That's exactly right. So yeah, I'd say I use these stances all of the time and I'm kind of making use of that strategy for sure. Hmm. That would, that would be an interesting, uh, you know, dance, dance class mm -hmm. workshop where, uh, you know, in, in West coast swing people, uh, the, the, the main lesson is like, okay, so you're going to dance, but here's, I want you to focus on sending love and kindness to your partner yeah, or something, you know? Yeah. And, and, and like, that's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, it's, it's the whole thing, but you know, it's a, it's, it's obviously, it can be quite complicated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff might come up, a lot of questions, uh, you know, what is this contemplative practice anyway, in the first place? Was I hearing before that with the stances, there's sort of a sense of like, if you make it explicit for a while and focus exclusively on one thing, then uh, it'll eventually be internalized and kind of be subconscious and automatic. Did I hear that that's, correctly? That's part of the idea. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, the same way that when you're learning the things in the very first place, um, you, you have to pay attention to them, it turns out. Um, you know, in order to get the timing of West Coast Swing, you know, one, two, three, and four, five, and six. I can do that automatically and I can, you know, count the timing. Um, but when I was first learning it, you know, the, the timing is like one of the 
first things you have to get automatic before you can really do much else. Um, so that you pay attention to it until you see what happens when you don't pay attention. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I just ask because I imagine if I did that workshop, say with West Coast Swing people, like they could make it the stance for, you know, a day or a week or whatever. And then it would become part of people's experience of like, oh, I can't have loving kindness for myself mm -hmm. or my partner or the other people in the room or whatever. Well, and, and it turns out that uh, one of the main things that, you know, advanced dancers work on is the basics. So I often find myself returning to a stance of like, okay, am I on time? What is, what is being on time? And usually I'll have like a sort of more evolved concept of what it means to be on time or what it means to be paying attention to my partner or um, to being playful as another stance. Like the reason there, there's a particular like thing I can try and it's like easier to point at when, when I say like, you know, staccato versus legato, but the many of the stances that have been, especially, you know, in the 2006 or 2016 time when I was doing too much, um, a lot of the dances were like far more general in the sense of like, okay, you know, pay attention to your activity and like, your, are you breathing? Are you, uh, is there a space? Can you, are you relaxing sometimes, you know? Um, and then, yeah, paying attention to my partner and what, 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 are, what are they doing? What do they want? Being playful with them, with me even, like, am I displaying my own playfulness? Um, those are all sorts of different stances I have had and practiced. Yeah. I just want to make explicit something that's occurring to me, if only for the record mm -hmm. or for people watching, but, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Rob Berbea at all. Uh, not very. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things he talks about is like what he calls ways of seeing or ways of looking and mm. really brings that and basically these stances into meditation and then there this is why he sort of prefers i think the the term ways of looking because it's not just about perceiving but like the way that you perceive changes the way you behave yeah. as well but i just want to make the connection there that like this is not like the what you're calling a stance which you're bringing into like a movement practice or some kind of activity is is not so different than what he's talking about with contemplative practices and that's that's really what i'm trying to do with the kind of dance that i'm doing yes uh, ab absolutely very much a similar thing um I'd, I'd forgotten that his thing was a way of seeing mm -hmm. um but yeah and this connects you know to uh perceptual control theory or predictive processing um and they're, those are slightly different um but they both have a similar thing around you know how you're perceiving the thing in the first place is uh inf influencing the perception comes first and you can sort of intervene on perception actually so that, you know, and then many other things follow from that, uh, mm -hmm. what you actually are able to see. Fascinating. Um, given that I've sort it, of given you a is, sense of it, is there anything you'd mm -hmm. want to share or ask or reflect? Um, well, I don't, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't, haven't, thought of, you know, using particular meditative practices in dancing as much as I've, I've had a more dance specific general thing. Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about the, um, actual dance practice <laughs> as well, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to just the meditative side mm -hmm. and see how they like connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, and this is part of why I'm curious to talk to, because like, I think I'd like to learn more from different dance traditions and incorporate that into what I'm trying to do, but, um, and like kind of confused about how to go about it. Because I like, just for example, I don't want to go and get good at West Coast Swing in the way that you did. As you sort of point out, people are going to have yeah. different goals. And so for me, the goal would be like, learn enough about a movement form that I can like incorporate it into the kind of dance I'm doing without like trying to become the best in the world at that style of dance. Um, but what I'm doing now is basically just like I turn on some music and I move my body in a way that feels good. It's very unscripted. I, I will say there's a lot of um, sort of signature moves that I've developed that are sort of mine and like they come from different movement practices that I've been exposed to. But the big one, I know this is one I make a lot of use of is, is sort of like 
this, like shooting with my hands. And I, I sort of visualize love and loving kindness as light coming out of my hands, like shooting to different people, either real or imaginary. And so there's a lot of this kind of thing in the movement that I do uh, that, that makes me super happy, but um, which is the point, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I get very yep. happy. Uh, but it, yeah, other than that, it's like, I don't know, just a guy dancing and moving his body. It's pretty, you can watch videos at this point of me dancing, but it's, there's no, I don't even know how I would describe what I do. Um, I guess there's a, there's actually a thread that I have about like dance skills that I've learned because I'm just teaching it myself. And it's like, I'm just sort of pointing to things that I do. Like mm -hmm. one thing that I do is like what I was talking about earlier with like switching from what I would describe as like sort of more like rectilinear motions to more like fluid and curvilinear type motions. And then like swapping those at a dime. Like it's fun to do that with the drop of a beat, for example. Like if it goes yeah. from like crescendos that's like fluid and then it drops and it's like boom 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 like boom 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 contrast uh, yeah exactly um but yeah other than that like i don't know i'm, I'm just kind of figuring it out so uh, basically the dance you're doing doesn't have a particular um tradition so to speak you're, you're sort of just like what is what are dance general dance? yeah yeah hmm and and your goal there you said at some point earlier was you know to be a dancer that inspires uh, others and mm -hmm. uh you know is, is graceful and whatnot um so i'm gonna ask a similar question on like where's where's your feedback mm. uh for this is it just it, it basically similar questions to the tai chi especially since it's also a solo activity like do you do you watch video do you watch videos of other people do you keep a journal of it mm. like it seems it sounds like you do you have do have this thing about the twitter and like what sort of skills you have been uh learning or thinking about um what other things happen that seem feedback shaped to you um, one is just how much fun I have with it. I am able to pay attention to that. And like, sometimes it's more fun than others. And usually it's fun, but it's like, how fun. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Another one is like, sometimes if I'm dancing in a public setting, people will want to dance with me or they'll be, ah. I'm pretty aware also of like other people's awareness and how they're paying attention to me. And so that's feedback. Um, I guess the other thing that I definitely should mention is yeah, that I'm I'm sort of in the process of making a, a second music video and I made a music video previously. And, you know, people's response to that is a kind of feedback of like people enjoy it and how, how they respond to it and whether they like it and uh, just what that's like. And that is sort of directly related to the whole goal of inspire people. So um, that's, that's some kind of feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Something that would be cool, I mm -hmm. think, I'm just put this out there, is uh, some kind of voiceover on your dancing on a music video. Mm. I'll put put that out there. Like mm. it's maybe it's if someone knows you, you, they can like imagine you know you're doing this loving kindness thing while you're dancing. But uh, it, would, it would be cool to I don't know hear something more about like what it, what it is like internally as well as you're doing the moves you're doing. Mm. Um, and like that, that might be part of the, uh, skills you might want to develop is how to, how to make, how you're, uh, feeling sort of more obvious, uh, in movement. Yeah. I'm getting the idea. I can do like a director's commentary type thing for the music videos, right? Like, I know, I've watched a bunch of those on like actual films, but it'd be cool to do that for mm. the music videos that I make, just kind of explaining what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, especially since your thing seems more uh, bespoke, more handcrafted, your dance form, I, like you get a lot of freedom to uh, think about the different skills you might want to develop mm -hmm. as well. Um, so that would be another thing I would do in, in the journal is just sort of like, you know, what, what sort of particular thing in your dancing would you like to be able to feel more of or do more of? And this, this doesn't even require you to watch your own dance videos. It's just like, you know, maybe you get, you're getting bored of certain 
moves and you want to figure out how to explore more variations mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or I mean, this, the smoothness is one you also talked about, um, just as an example. Uh, maybe you want to incorporate more like uh, movement with your, your feet in what's happening. Uh, I, I noticed you were mostly like sort of standing and doing mm -hmm. this. And I was like, yeah, that was partly uh, uh, that was partly just because of the camera setup. But uh, typically right. I move a lot more with my feet. But uh, the next video, thankfully, will have some of that because there's multiple cameras for the next one. So it's going to be ah, really good. good. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. One thing I'm curious about just to ask is like, um, you know, I mentioned that I might be interested in sort of um, cross training and other dance forms where like yeah. the goal wouldn't be mastery of the other dance form, but just learn enough to like kind of bring it back into the main thing that I'm trying to do. And I'm curious if you have any suggestions for how I might go about that or, or even like which dance forms might be particularly interesting or yeah, just how I would approach that. So the world of contemporary dance has a bunch of different methods in it mm -hmm. um, that they're, they're almost like stances as I understand them. Um, I don't, I don't remember any of them in particular well enough. I just have a few friends who have talked talk to me about it. Um, so there might be a very straightforward sort of uh, class or thing to go to in contemporary dance. I, I, as I understand, it's contemporary or modern dance that hmm. you could find a lot of these things. Um, and, and you want to be looking for some kind of uh, method or something in the, in the title of how they uh, generate the movements that they do. Um, that would be one sort of straightforward way. Um, you might you might have another straightforward way of just watching other people dance mm -hmm. and see what they do that you, you don't mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. be like, mm. Mm -hmm. those are some things. Um, and yeah, I would focus most, contemporary is the most interesting of like having different ways of moving because they're they're really trying to express something in particular a lot of the time as opposed to being constrained to a particular way of movement like ballet they're trying to express things but their ballet has a way of doing things that is very shut up like it's very rigid um hip-hop is like uh they also have it's a bit more free form and that but there's a lot of uh conventions in mm. hip-hop uh, or like break dancing or whatever, right? Mm. Um, nevertheless, hip hop might also be something else. Hip hop, or um, I don't know. In, insofar as you want to make love to the universe, you might uh, go to some like sexy street dances as well. I went to one of those, and that was very fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, those are some great yeah. ideas. Um, mm. You might look for. Galen Hooks in particular might be someone to look at. Hmm. Okay. Is there anything that feels uh, adjacent to anything that we've talked about that you'd like to dive in more about? Let me just have a quick look here. I I, I want to go back a bit to how how do I think of West Coast Swing as meditative or having some kind of practice, and the almost the very first thing I said of like where's your attention, mm. what are you actually learning, um, is is where where this applies. Mm. Uh, I didn't quite get to the part where you know when you're practicing some movement and you you want to do the automatic version that happens. Uh, for yourself, when you're improving it, you you want to like. There's a certain way it feels to do a movement, and this does not always line up with how it looks on video. And part of when I'm watching myself dance uh, and imagining, you know, what it feels like to be doing the movements, you can notice like a, a an error in like, oh, I imagined this move looked like this, um, and it actually looked different than how it looked. This is one way to start building another feedback loop, 
um, if you're imagining yourself and you're seeing this difference between what it looks like and what you're trying to do, you can be like, okay, so when I try and do this thing, it looks like that. Mm -hmm. um, you can also get you know, feedback from someone else on how to do this, but the there, there's a meditation practice in watching videos and in dancing, something like a meditation. There's an attention practice, mm -hmm. I, I maybe mm -hmm. it would be better mm -hmm. to say, in how you watch videos um, and and how when you when you're dancing, noticing what you're paying attention. There's a, there's a mindfulness element in particular. Mm -hmm. And also, when you're watching your dance videos, you wanna you wanna make notes of what you have improved at, what you're actually good at, um, at the same time as you know what you want to improve on. Um, and I this I think has helped me get better at watching my own dance videos uh, versus just having like vague, cloudy, ah, oh, this is not good. There's like, okay, well, like this thing, this thing, this thing is not particularly good. This thing was good. This thing was good. This thing has improved. Um, there's there's a more like, you can get more traction on it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than you might otherwise. I might've been repeating myself a little bit there, but I felt like there was something something new to tie it into the meditative stuff. Definitely. I yeah. don't think I have much else right now. Great. Well, I asked every single question I possibly could around this topic at this time. So I'm very grateful for your time and, and the expertise and, and care that you bring to this. And it'll definitely be affecting my Tai Chi and, and dance practices or other movement practices that I do. And, um, and I think others will find this conversation useful and interesting as well. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It's been great to be here. <laughs>